All right, well, welcome everybody to an ocean view of UCSB, a virtual exploration of marine science. Uh, I'm Scott Simon, the director of the Research Experience and Education Facility, better known as the Reef. Um, it's UCSB's teaching aquarium. And you can see from uh, Zoe Manolo's camera that um, we are located right at the end of Lagoon Road, uh, right next to Campus Point Beach. It is another, um, well, just another day in paradise, I guess. Um, I wanna welcome you guys. I'm so excited we got a great crowd here today. Uh, the Reef is run by uh, UCSB undergraduates, uh, many of them aquatic bio majors, uh, environmental study majors, but a lot of other majors as well. And it is a great resource at UCSB as well as an opportunity for undergraduates uh, to get involved. I have about 40 undergrads currently working and that is in the days of the Kanono as well. So we've been doing a lot of things via Zoom, remotely, uh, YouTube channels, but um, we are gonna Zoom live today from inside the aquarium uh, and joining me today um, is Josie Spiegelman, a freshman here at UCSB and who um, recently took over as my program coordinator. So uh, you guys get involved early um, anywhere. Uh, but Josie, why don't you take it away? Yeah, hi, my name is Josie. I can't believe that it is already my third quarter here at UCSB. I'm a Japanese and environmental studies double major. And basically I'm the program coordinator. So if you ever email the reef, you're gonna be talking to me and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you guys might have. And Josie will be adding all of um, our pertinent deets, uh, email addresses and links uh, to our other resources in the chat box. Um, Kyler, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, hi everybody. So uh, I actually just graduated from UCSB. Uh, I was an aquatic biology major with a spatial studies minor, and I'm the tropical aquarist at the reef. So I take care of all the tropical fish, the ones you'd recognize from, you know, like Finding Movie or Finding Nemo, movies like that. And we'll check those tanks out in a second. But I'm excited to get to engage with you all and answer any questions you might have. Mackenzie. Hi everybody, I'm Mackenzie. I'm a second year biopsychology major um, and I've been working at the reef for about two quarters now. The coronavirus kind of put a stop in when I was originally hired, but it's been a lot of fun and yeah. All right, and Jordan. Hello everybody, I am Jordan. I'm a first year at UCSB studying uh, pre-biology with an education minor. Um, and this is my third quarter at UCSB, my first quarter uh, here at The Reef. I'm super excited. If you have any further questions for me, you can always reach out on Instagram. Very cool, and David Wenzel. Hi guys, my name is David Wenzel and I'm a fourth year environmental studies major here at UCSB. Um, this is actually my second quarter, kind of like Mackenzie. I kind of got screwed over by the Kanono, um, but I'm here making the most out of it. If you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out. Yeah, and um, and that is a point. I, my daughter is in her first quarter um, of college, and uh, things really changed last year and this year for a lot of you guys um, heading into college. We're excited that it looks like, fingers crossed, the university is gonna be opening up um, classes in the fall. Um, so that uh, hopefully uh, will come to be and we'll see you guys on campus. Um, the final two uh, panelists joining us are uh, Zoe Manolo and uh, Madagimba Borsi. You guys wanna introduce yourselves? Go ahead and unmute your mic. Uh, hi, guys. hi guys. Um, I am Madigan. I am a second year here at UCSB studying aquatic biology with a feminist studies minor. Um, and this is, I'm in my second year of working at the reef and I'm super excited to share it with you guys. 
And hi guys, my name is Zoe. I am a third year cell and developmental bio major, um, minoring in English. And I've also been at the reef for about two years now, and I'm super excited to bring you inside and around our tanks. So, so we, have been, we have been very fortunate um, that the university values the reef so much um, that I have been uh, able to bring five undergraduates onto campus. Uh, they are my Aquarists. Kyler is one of them as well. Um, that Zoe and Madigan are also Aquarists. So they help take care of the fish and the tanks and the systems. Um, and I should just stop talking and we should just head on into the reef. Again, I want to thank you guys for coming. I'm going to bounce out and turn it over to these guys because they're a lot cooler and funner than I am. Um, so if you've committed to UCSB, congratulations, welcome. I am also uh, a gaucho. I went to UCSB and I was a transfer student. Um, so there is a special place in my heart and the reef uh, for transfer students as well. So um, sit back, enjoy the ride, ask lots of questions. And if you haven't committed um, by the end of this, I'm sure that you will. Uh, so everybody take care, have a great weekend, um, and I look forward to seeing you guys in the fall. All right, so to start us off, uh, what we're looking at right here is the lagoon on UCSB's campus, this water right in front of us. And then, um, Zoe, if you can pan to the left, right out there is Campus Point Beach. So uh, on campus, that's an awesome tide pooling spot. Right now, uh, there's a lot of sand on the beach. The tide pools are all covered up. Other times of the year, especially during the winter, um, the sand will be off the beach and it's just covered in tide pools. There's octopus, tons of cool things that you can see out there. And then out beyond that is the Santa Barbara Channel, which is the ocean that runs between um, the coastal of California, Santa Barbara, and the Channel Islands, which if you look closely, they kind of look like clouds right now, uh, but that's actually Santa Cruz Island, which is one of the biggest islands uh, off the shore of Santa Barbara. And then you can head on into the reef. <clears throat> so, I as I think Scott said, uh, REEF is an acronym. It's the Research Experience Education Facility. So uh, we're involved in doing a lot of the outreach for the research that occurs on campus. And we do lots of education things with different schools in the areas, uh, elementary schools, middle, high school, and uh, other groups that come in just to come learn about marine science uh, in the REEF. And so there's two really cool research programs that were uh, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly involved with, one of which is the SBC LTER, the Santa Barbara Coastal Long-Term Ecological Research Program. And uh, they're interested in looking at long-term patterns in the Santa Barbara Channel, so the oceans off Santa Barbara, uh, and the different ecological things that are happening with those patterns. So something that they're super interested in, which you'll see in this tank right in front of us, is kelp and the distributions and abundances of kelp in the channel. So they study lots of different things like where it's found, uh, different impacts on the kelp, uh, things like urchin grazing. Uh, they found that uh, waves have a really big impact on where you can actually find kelp, like the waves crashing on the shore actually destroys a lot of it and determines where it's actually found out in the channel. Uh, and then we're just, we're the outreach for the SBC LTER. So uh, we get to teach about all the cool research that they do with things like the kelp, uh, other animals like uh, the California spiny lobster. They do a lot of research on the fisheries for those. Um, and then it's really cool is if you work at the reef, uh, there's lots of opportunities to actually get to work with research programs such as the LTERs and get to do research on these cool things that we then go and teach to the public. So uh, there's many people who have worked at the reef who became scientific scuba divers. There's a whole certification process that you go through and they now dive with uh, programs like the SBC LTER and are able to go out and do the research under the water, which is crazy cool. Uh, I'm a scuba diver, but I'm not a scientific diver, so I don't go out with any labs, but there's tons of cool stuff to see scuba diving and free diving out in the channel. Uh, the other research program that we work with 
is the Moraine Coral Reef Long-Term Ecological Research Program. So this tank right here, you'll see is a model for what it might look like if you were to go out to Morea. And uh, so if you look at the poster on the back, there's a map over there. So Morea is part of French Polynesia, that French Polynesian island chain. You can see, can you guys point out on that map on the left where it is? See, there's the US up there, Australia, smack dab in the middle of the Pacific. Uh, Morea is right next to Tahiti. But there's tons of cool coral reefs out there. Uh, the Marine Coral Reef uh, Long-Term Ecological Research Station is interested in coral, whereas in Santa Barbara, they're interested in the kelp because that's the major organism that creates habitat out there. But uh, they're just like the SBC LTR, interested in changes in coral around this island over time and uh, different impacts on the coral. So they have tracked things like how hurricanes have affected uh, distribution of coal around the islands. Um, there's been breakouts in tropical oceans of uh, a sea star called the crown of thorns sea star and those guys love to eat coral so they've tracked how those have impacted coral over time uh, and just like with the SBC LTER we also do the outreach for the MCR LTER so we have these cool tropical tanks which are what Maddie and I take care of that uh, showcase some of the cool organisms that you can find out if you were to go to Morea. So right here we have Clyde, which is a stars and stripes pufferfish. It's pretty cool. And then we got some clownfish in there somewhere, two different kinds of butterfly fish. But uh, another cool thing with the MCR LTER, they have a lab on campus. And just like with the other lab, uh, if you get involved in scientific diving, you can actually get the chance to go out to the uh, to Morea and do research on the island. And there's also been numerous people from the reef who have gone out to uh, do research on the island. And it's crazy cool experience, once in a lifetime. Uh, lots of awesome stuff to see out there. So with that, I'll pass it over to Zoe and Madigan and I'll show you guys some of the awesome animals that we keep in the reef. Hi guys. So as Kyler was saying, Madigan is one of our top aquarists and I'm just a general aquarist. Um, but we do have a lot of research opportunities here at the reef. A lot of our undergrads are involved in a ton of different research labs in the EEMB or MCDB departments. Um, Madigan and I are actually in the same lab working with the Morea Coral Reef. Um, the Bergophile lab, and we are looking at herbivorous fish and how they play a really big role in making sure that coral reefs that have been hit by bleaching events stay coral and not algae. Um, and herbivorous fish play a big role in that because they make sure the algae does not overtake the reef space. So. Yeah, just like Zoe said, so we're both involved in um, watching some of the MCR footage, so it's really interesting to be able to see the uh, model tank here and then watch real footage of the MCR on our own. Yeah, so in addition to our research, we have other tanks back here. Um, a big point of me for coming to this school was looking at a ton of research opportunities. That's what I wanted to do um, and becoming part of the reef you have the opportunity to network with a ton of people, um, a ton of different labs. Kyler is in the Culver Lab looking at scallops and how to fish them sustainably. Um, but yes, becoming involved in the reef. Um, Jersey, you want to answer that question? Um, but becoming involved with the reef, you get to meet so many different people. Um, and more than not, there are opportunities to join a lab and get research experience at a pretty, um, not young, but a pretty early stage in your college career. Um, and speaking of more research that we're involved in, we have a really cool project going on back here in these white tanks. So, if anyone has any clue as to what kind of organisms these are, please let us know your guess in the chat. A hint is that they're in the same family of what Gary is from SpongeBob. 
so these are some really cool snails. They're called the Kellett's Whelk. And this is a up and coming project from one of the PhD students in the Marine Science Institute's new head, um, the Hoffman Lab. And this PhD student who is working on these tanks, her name is Sochi Claire. And this is a really important experiment because we are looking at these snails um, in terms of their population and their reproductive rate and how marine heat waves affect the populations of these snails. So in Santa Barbara, we have our harbor and there is a lot of fishing done. Um, we got abalones, urchins, and Kellett's welts are now being looked at as a food as a type of snail that we can consume. Um, and so this project is looking how at how climate change can affect money, um, how climate change can affect the reproductive cycles of these snails. So on the bottom here, we have little H's in Sharpie, if you can see. They're actually in a heat treatment. So their water is mimicking the temperatures of what a marine heat wave would look like in the Santa Barbara Channel. And up here is the cold water treatment, which mimics the temperatures of the average temperatures in the channel. So these are about 13 degrees Celsius, which is about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And down here, the hot temperature is around 19 degrees Celsius, which is about 68 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And I'm gonna zoom over here really quick. So we also have welts in our tanks that are not part of the experiment. And these things all along the trillet here and on that post back there, those are eggs laid by Kellett welts. So in these little sachets, there's about 2000 eggs for one little sack. And because they're so small, a degree change in temperature can have a really big effect on them. So we are looking out to see Sochi's whelks and how soon they are to lay eggs. So we can start looking at how these temperature changes affect their progeny. Um, there's a ton of other research projects back here we have one of our other aquarists working outside on these scallops. She's also in the same lab as Kyler. But overall, we just have a ton of different research opportunities for you guys to get involved with. If you join the reef, if you don't join the reef, then there is also more labs out there. But the reef is a really, really good way to get involved. So, yes. um, which, sorry. Go ahead, um, on that note, I just want to make it clear to everybody that um, to apply, we usually host applications in the fall and uh, spring quarter. So email me, I'll put the information in the chat at the end so that you guys know everything. Awesome. Thank you, Josie. <laughs> I'd like to jump in and answer one of the questions that we got, which is how important is it to be SCUBA certified to study marine science? And for that one, um, I'd say that it actually isn't important at all. If that's something that you want to do, you can definitely get scuba certified and do that. But there's tons and tons of marine scientists who have never stepped a foot in the water. Uh, marine science isn't just actually jumping in the water and like looking at stuff scuba diving. Uh, it's a huge field with many different things. Uh, there's oceanography, so studying like currents in the ocean, maybe from a boat or with uh, like drones in the water, different sensors. Uh, other things like you could do coastal ecology where you're just walking up and down the beach and studying the organisms that you find on the beach. Uh, like the lab that I work in, we work with scallops. So we just have tanks that we have set up on campus where we grow our scallops in the tanks and do different things with them. And uh, that's another cool thing about UCSB is there's lots of research that happens on campus because we actually have huge pumps that pump uh, salt water from the ocean onto campus. So there's a few different buildings on campus that have saltwater tanks inside that are getting fresh ocean water, where instead of having to go out into the ocean and do experiments, they can all be done in the building in a lab. So you definitely don't need to be scuba certified, but it's a really cool thing to do if you do want to do that. Um, and to answer the second question that we got, 
Uh, do you have, have we all taken marine science classes before entering college? Uh, not everyone here has taken or have, has had experience in marine science. Like um, I going to UCSB didn't have any experience, but what I love about UCSB is that I can just, um, I feel like I can just walk into or take any class that I want to or that I'm interested in, like uh, whether it's band or marine science experience, um, prehand experience is not always uh, necessary. Okay, thank you guys for answering those questions. Um, we are gonna jump into looking at some fun creatures we have at the reef and then save our Q&A for like the last 10 to 15 minutes. So Madigan here is standing in front of one of our touch tanks. And we have a ton of really cool creatures in here. You want to pick one up? So a question we like to ask, we do a lot of programs here at the Reef um, from kindergarten students all the way up to college students. Um, we also have open door programs where we are open to the public, but we always like to ask the question as to what is this? <laughs> And if they say a starfish, if this is considered a fish or not. Um, so I'm gonna answer that question for you. Um, we call these sea stars and they are not technically fish. Um, there are a set of differences between them. Um, this is one of the bat stars we have. We have I think three different species of sea stars in this tank right now. Um, Madigan is holding a bat star and they come in all sorts of patterns and colors. Um, right there in the corner, we have one that we like to call the koi star because it looks like a koi fish. Um, this one is orange. That one has purple and white on them. So there's a lot of variety within this species. Um, this one has six stars and we have <laughs> another sea star in here. I'm not sure where it is that has four legs instead of five. Um, Usually sea stars have more than five legs due to a genetic mutation, or if they have say four legs, they probably lost one of their legs during an incident. Um, but what's really cool about sea stars is that they're able to regenerate their legs if given the time to do so. Um, I wanna flip one mm -hmm. over. So what's really fun about sea stars is that they have their mouths on the underside of their body. Um, right here you can see their mouths and we were able to feed them yesterday so you might be able to see their stomachs but they're able to basically throw up their stomach out of their mouth and eat one of their favorite foods is mussels. Um, in that context they throw out their stomachs and digestive enzymes get to break through um, and basically dissolve the muscles. And once they're done eating, they retract their stomachs back into their mouths and that's how they eat. Um, and you can see it on this sea star, um, these little things right here along their legs, those are their tube feet and they use their tube feet to walk around and stick to things like the side of the tank. Um, sea stars have a hydrovascular system so like us, we have blood running through our veins, whereas these guys can regulate how much water they have in their bodies. Um, you wanna pick up this yeah. spiny one? So this is our great spiny sea star. <laughs> They're pretty strong, so they might, we'll see if Madigan can get one off on the ground. <laughs> yes, so, um, <laughs> A really fun way we like to model the hydrovascular system in a sea star is to take these, this species of spiny sea star, um, and they have these spines all along their legs. Um, you can see these are all like tiny little tweezers. And so if you hold it against your arm, you can see it's kind of fucking up the hairs on my arm. <laughs> so I like to show people that's how they would move food from on top, they can move it all the way down towards their mouth like that. Oh, see, it looks like this guy just finished eating a muscle. Oh, 
But yeah, using the spiny sea stars, we like to show how they regulate their water and their bodies. So if you hold it up by their legs like this, um, you'll start to see that the spines up here become more pronounced and down here it's a lot more fleshy. And that is because gravity is pulling the water inside their bodies downward. And that is how we model their hydrovascular system. Um, we also have a lot of cool things in this tank, including, where is it? A red sea urchin. We have two species of sea urchin at the reef, a purple and red. Um, like sea stars, they have two feet as well within their spines. Um, and you can see their spines are moving towards her finger right now. And they also have their mouths on the underside of their stomach right here. Um, and they are voracious kelp eaters. So what's really important about sea urchins is that if their populations get too big in kelp forests, they can basically devastate a forest in a matter of time. Um, so it is really important to keep their populations in check so we can keep our kelp forest off the channel healthy. Um, and over here, he's not happy. <laughs> we have a sea cucumber. Um, a fun fact about these guys is that when a predator comes to try to attack them, they're able to throw up their innards and shoot themselves away. And like sea stars, they're able to regenerate all their guts, which is a little gnarly, but evolution. <laughs> um, this one is pretty stressed right now. You can tell because it's pretty like tense. Um, usually they're more gelatinous, gelatinous. <laughs> um, but yes. So this is our tank of sea stars. We will move over here. Oh, perfect example of how a <laughs> lobster swims. We have a couple of spiny, California spiny lobsters in the reef. I'll swing downwards in a moment to show you one of our superstars. Oh, right here we have a smaller spiny lobster. Um, they're called spiny lobsters because they have tail or spines on their tails right here all along their tails and as you were yep all on their carapace um and as you can see by it's flicking its tail that's their mechanism for swimming so if you saw earlier one of the lobsters was pretty unhappy that it was being held and swam away backwards and speaking of spiny lobsters, we have one of the most beautiful creatures I have ever seen in my life. This is Boris. He is our resident giant spiny lobster, um, currently hiding in his cave. But to give you an idea about how big he is, I'm gonna take you guys over here. So lobsters are, they don't have, a spine like us. They're um, not vertebrates. They have an exoskeleton and are able to molt once a year. So this is Boris's latest molt. Um, I'll place my hand next to it. It's pretty large. Yeah. Um, this is also one of our bigger spiny lobsters, but it can't even compare to how giant Boris is. Um, usually I would ask some quick math questions. The carapace <laughs> grows at least one eighth of an inch every time they molt. And since we've measured his mold, it's about 10 inches. And if you're able to do some quick math, you'll be able to figure out that Boris is actually about 80 years old. So he's been around for quite a while now. Um, and yeah, we inherited him from, I think a study that, <laughs> was looking at how like lobster vitality and how long they can live for. Um, essentially lobsters can live for a very, very long time. It's just that in the wild, their molts can get really, really heavy 
and slow them down to the point where they can't get food as easily as they could beforehand. Um, switching gears to some other awesome animals. In this tank, we have some baby sharks right there. And then we have two over here by the wolf eggs. Um, Madigan, you want to tell us about these sharks? Sure. So these guys are swell sharks. Um, I actually wrote a paper on them last year during my first year in oceanography, which was super fun. Um, because I actually got to write a paper about something I cared about in my life in high school. Uh, but small sharks are called that because in order to stay put in the current or to avoid predators, they will wedge themselves between rocks and then swallow up a whole bunch of water so that they swell up and they get stuck in a crevice, which is super awesome. And if you take a look at the patterns, you can kind of see uh, what actually happens is under a black light or a UV light, all those lighter patches glow green. And each shark has its own pattern, which is distinct, kind of like a fingerprint. Um, but that was one of the recent discoveries about small sharks. And what I wrote my paper about was their patterns in UV light. And we have a couple of bigger small sharks in here. Let's see. And then if you take a look right here, you can see what you might, if you found them on the beach, they might have been brown or dried up, what people might call mermaid purses, are swell shark eggs. And they have these tendrils that they stay together and wrapped around kelp so they don't blow away in the current as well. And you can kind of see where the yolk is in there, the lighting's right. Uh, so those are swell shark eggs. And then we also have two- Oh, oh. okay. Hi. <laughs> we also have two horn sharks in here, which are called because they have two tiny little, what look like thorns or horns right in front of each of their dorsal fins, which is a really cool aspect of those. It's kind of showing off. Wow. <laughs> it's about feeding day. Yeah, so the small sharks get really excited when it's feeding day and they usually swim up <laughs> at the top of the water like this. Um, yeah. So these eggs and most of the juvenile small sharks that we have here were laid or came from our two female small sharks in that big tank with Boris. So all of these guys were born in the reef. Um, and I, yes, so it is about 3.35. Um, if you guys want to start asking questions, feel free to do so. Um, questions about the reef, about UCSB, undergrad life, research, Yes, so we can start answering those questions as soon as we go back outside. Um, I'm just going to show you this guy real quick. Uh, he's just wedged right over there. This is our California Moray eel. Um, it's a little stuck right now. He just wedged himself in between this pipe and the tank. But the California Moray eels actually have two sets of jaws. They're a little bit scary since they can't really see and they have some tiny beady eyes. Um, so they use their smell as a predominant source of finding prey. Um, but when they do find their prey, they have that one set of jaws in their mouth and then another set of jaws lodged in the back of their throat that just comes out and grabs their prey. So that is the last creature that we will show you guys today. Um, I'll take you to Clyde one more time. Say goodbye. He's okay. another <laughs> superstar we have at the reef. Um, but yes, so we're gonna head outside now um, and do like a little Q and A for him to answer any of your questions. Yeah, so Alyssa asks, uh, how difficult would you say it is to transfer into the aquatic bio major, I believe? <laughs> Anyone? Very easy. Um, UCSB has this, it, it's like set up in a way that you come in as a pre-bio major. So you're taking like chemistry classes, like intro chemistry classes, 
intro bio classes for the first two years. And once you complete those classes, you're able to declare your major. Um, so did you, have you declared it? No, I will be declaring at the end of this quarter. So yeah, you get about two full years ish of intro classes that all bio majors pretty much have to go through and you can start taking some aquatic bio classes before that but not a ton and then you declare pretty much towards the end of your second year so it's pretty easy to take care of if you do the bio requirements yes um and if you decide you don't want or you don't like what major you intended on going into um i came in here looking to be an aquatic bio major and then last minute switch to cell and developmental. Um, it's really easy to change your major once you're in the pre-major. All right, and then Oliver also asks, what is your guys' best memory at the reef? And I feel that one of you would be better equipped to answer this. Tyler, what about yeah, you? Tyler. <laughs> Yes, I am the old man of the reef. I've been working here for four years, so I have many things to pull from. But uh, I'd say my favorite memory, um, we also do stuff during the summer. And so what, two summers ago now, uh, we do this trip where we take a bunch of middle school students out on dive boats, like the boats that go out for, with scuba divers. We, uh, we took them out to the islands and then taught them about marine science out at the Channel Islands. So it was super cool because I got to teach how to do fish surveys. So I'd take a bunch of 12 year olds into the ocean. We'd swim from the boat to the island and then snorkel and just count fish all day. And crazy cool experience. It was awesome. Uh, yeah, so that's another cool thing you can do at the reef is during the summers, there's lots of um, really fun things that we do on campus and in the local area where you get to go and just explore and do fun things with uh, kids. Um. I don't think we bit. have anyone that can beat that. Madigan, do you have any off the top of your head? Any favorite memories? Um, I like when I tell my friends to come in, you know, Friday afternoon, Saturdays, typically we have open doors, so we're open to the public. So I like to tell my friends to come and visit me at work and I get to show off all my knowledge and basically do what we did here today, but with my friends and they get to you know, when there's not coronavirus, they can come in and pick up all those animals that I was showing you guys and all those critters. So that was really fun for me last year. Yeah. Um, off the top of my head, I don't, I like doing programs a lot. Um, we did last year before the whole pandemic started, we would work with the local elementary school here in Goleta. Um, it's like a reading, writing program. And we would have like little stations and teach them about fishing in the harbor and really cool animals that we'd find out in the channel. Um, also going tide pulling with them, it's really fun. So that would be mine. All right, and then Jody asks, how competitive are the marine science programs here? Kyler, do you have an answer? So for that, I'd say that um, for EMB especially, uh, there is not a competitive atmosphere in classes or to get into the major or any sort of thing. It's actually really collaborative between people in classes. Uh, everyone's usually pretty down to help each other in those classes, help with studying. There's no like, oh no, you can't have my notes because I need to get a better grade than you. Like everyone's really helpful towards each other and th there's not a competitive atmosphere at all within the ecology departments. And then I saw that um, Alyssa had a second part to her question. It was, do you think there are many opportunities presented to prepare you for after graduating? And I would say yes, because the upper division classes, uh, a lot of them have labs and the labs are super helpful where they give you um, experience doing different sorts of things with science, both in the lab and the field, like learning how to measure certain things, uh, skills for like scientific writing, all those sorts of things. So the labs, especially um, for upper division classes, give you tons of actual experience that is experience you could put on a resume. And I've actually used in interviews talking about things I've done in classes that would be relevant for jobs that I've been looking at. All right, and then a follow up question to Jody's is if there are like what the acceptance rates for marine science programs are. 
Um, I'm under the impression that there aren't any, but I'm not sure. Yeah, th there's no acceptance rate for uh, aquatic bio or ecology and evolution. Um, it's if you're interested in it and have the grades, which I think is a 2.0 average GPA, you'll get into the major. There's no cutoff for the number of people that can be in the major. All right, well, that looks like all of the open questions. Um, we have a couple more minutes if anybody else wants to ask anything, we're here. If not, I will put our information into the chat. And so you guys can reach out to us with any questions or if you're just interested in learning more, we have a YouTube channel that we started during COVID, I believe. So you can check us out there. Anyone else, any closing remarks? Oh, Allison asks if there are any cool study abroad places that you guys would remember. Go ahead. Um, there's an Australia program that you can go um, and snorkel and explore the Great Barrier Reef. And there's a lot of, um, you get a lot of research credits and a lot of practical uh, practice. Um, I am not gone. I have friends who are going. Uh, I wish I could go. Uh, but yes, it's something that I've definitely looked into. You should definitely look it up. It's super cool. And it looks like a really good time. Yeah. In addition to the Australia one, there's also some in New Zealand. I think some in Latin America. Um, and there are also programs like Kyler mentioned at the beginning of this webinar. Um, you can join your labs and even go to Morea and do some really cool scientific diving there. Or if not scientific diving, just um, research on the island. So there's a lot of really cool opportunities in this department for studying abroad. All right, well, uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed our, our tour. Um, thanks so much for stopping in. I think we'll have some more over the summer if you decide to go to UCSB or have already committed. That's actually how I got into the reef during a little orientation. So there's definitely a lot of ways for you guys to reach out to us and we would love to hear from you.